and I think we're pretty much all set up and ready to go. So I'm going to break protocol here, which I try to do at least once a day to stick it to the man, and uh, get let Sergey start off a, a, few, a couple of minutes early, um, just so you can have that extra couple of minutes for questions, or you know maybe you just talk really, really slow. We'll have to find out um, how good of a presenter he is. So um, this is Sergey. He's going to be talking with us about digital slavery and digital freedom. Uh, let's go and give him a great big hand. Right. Thank you. And... Let me just wait, yeah. So uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, as Diego said, about digital slavery and freedom in terms of Web 2 and Web 3. And I think the topic is a little bit oversold, but um, I think a lot of people underestimate what it actually means to, to people and how it actually works and what can be done about it. And at the end, I'm going to mention what we do at Cyber Congress and how we try to solve those problems. So uh, everybody calls it Web3, we call it the Great Web. Why? Because we think the name is cooler than Web3, the Great Web sounds much better. And um, the way, uh, there's a lot of descriptions on the internet about Web3 and my personal description, well, it's right there, but the idea is that it's a direct uh, in, in communication between different parties, whether they're nodes, robots, or humans, doesn't matter really, uh, without any black box intermediaries. Uh, their coordination, their cooperation between one each other and the motivation between the users to do so. So obviously we're talking about some digital tokens or crypto or whatever, right? It can be NFT tokens, they can be non-NFT tokens, it doesn't really matter as long as that communication is motivated. Uh, which basically also introduces civil resistance as well. In, so we can fight spam if we don't have the civil resistance as well. So that's really important and that's how I see Web3. So um, this is like the progress of semantics and um, the picture is a bit, well, it's my bad. It's not really good quality, but basically it's talking about the PC era, the Usernet era, and going up to Web 1, Web 2, Web 3, and it has right up the Web 4. And to me, that's actually a pretty scary concept because if the way the web continues to evolve actually gets to Web 4, it might look like an automated gearbox. What I mean by an automated gearbox is where everything is already decided for you and humans don't really have a decision in what they do, how they do it, or, you know, well, don't have any say in what to do. So our mission, and I'm going to talk about ourselves, I mean, every human kind on Earth, or every species on Earth that can think for themselves, I think their mission is to understand that in order for us not to get to the web for that the corporations see it, uh, we need to do something about the current web and the development of Web3. Um, well, some numbers, 23% uh, of the internet is, is free, and that's not a great number. That means that, you know, 77%, if my math is correct, is not free, and that's from Freedom House. 47% um, of the world population have some social media blocked. That's not okay. That's more than half. 42% uh, of the world population have the internet caused due to political reasons, so that's from internet trends. Uh, countries like Kazakhstan, USA, Russia, China, New Zealand, Australia, UK uh, introduced restriction laws. And that's not normal, guys. Uh, the previous speaker mentioned digital awareness and digital self, right? Actually, I think it's all been already done. Uh, there is cryptography, public key and a private key, and that kind of solves the whole question, which is basically your fingerprint. You have your digital print, what we, which is basically the, the representation of your soul. And for the past 20 years, all of us have been going on the internet and living some kind of a print. And uh, well, it's not okay to introduce restrictions from the governments in order to restrict those things. Um, this is just another picture of who owns, well, it should be the internet, but in my opinion, who owns you? Because each single person uses the internet. And well, there, is, there are very few beneficiaries to the internet unfortunately, and this is just like a picture of how they look, and you can see that all those companies, they basically own each other, and you know, that, that's not normal. Um, why is it like that? Well, uh, it's, quite, it's quite simple. Uh, there is three protocols that really help the internet to evolve, but they kind of fucked up the internet as well, so which is DNS, HTTP, and URL. Uh, I call them Dante's worst nightmare, so if you ever read you know, the book, then you realize what I'm talking about. Uh, the problem is centralized top-level domains, no internet, uh, no interest of solving securities to the beneficiaries who own the internet right now, reselling the data, uh, uncontrolled data loss, and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, I'm not going to talk about pocket routing because I think all of you know how it works. But if you do know how location uh, 
based address in works, it's not normal. It, it's it's just it's fucked up. So um, this is what Google collects about you, right? And this is not all. So this is just some things. I'm not gonna go over them, obviously. Um, so if you have like a phone in your in your pocket right now, even if you have Google Sync switched on, uh, off, sorry. Uh, it's still collecting some of this information and the previous speaker mentioned Cambridge Analytica, it's my favorite case. And those guys had, at the top level, they had, well on average they had 5,000 touch points on every uh, US citizen, but at the top they had 70,000 touch points on certain citizens. I mean, does anybody here know like 1,000 things about themselves? I mean, I personally really don't, so when, when somebody tells me they know 70,000 things about me in order for me to make a decision based on semantics, which is political or social, that, that's not okay. Um, well, the great web, back, back, back to the, the good stuff. Uh, those are some of the virtues that I think, that I personally believe that the, the, few, the web tree should, should have, which is offline browsing, uh, local data caching, and if you all know, 80% of data is pretty much the same, so it's really easy to cache it locally. Uh, local service, reputation, efficient. Uh, TCRs, uh, IPFS, because I think IPFS is, 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 really, is a really important protocol. Uh, cyber registries, what I mean by that is that people should have the ability to prove something that they do without actually revealing their own identity. Uh, miners are service providers. I think the miners of the future are service providers of the future. Uh, well, I'm, I use the word miner in broader terms, right? It doesn't have to be a miner who actually mines something. It could be proof of stake, proof of work, proof of authority, whatever the consensus is. I, I call it a miner. Uh, there should be some kind of a ranking mechanism, an indexation mechanism, because without that, that's not gonna really move any forward. It should be decentralized, and there should be a consensus mechanism, or some kind of a consensus mechanism in all of that picture in order for people to agree on what they agree on. Otherwise, it's not gonna work. So, um, what do we do about it? And well, I couldn't not mention ourselves, you know, I love myself, so yeah. Uh, basically, we are making, we, we, we did, it's already, it's already working. Uh, the project has been live for three years, it's on GitHub. Uh, everything that we do is open source, and basically it's a search protocol. And what we do, we use IPFS and Tendermint. Uh, we let the user uh, create what we call a cyberlink, which is not a hyperlink, it's a completely different thing. But basically, a user connects with the help of semantics two different IPFS hashes. Uh, he then puts them on a knowledge, they are then computed on a knowledge graph. Uh, that information is dynamically ranked. Uh, this is the rank mechanism, but this, you know, it's a bit, it's a bit complicated. But anyways, the protocol is community governed. So uh, in theory, that's, well, we hope, because the ranking mechanism is always kind of a red herring. We hope that the governance can, through A-B testing, change that as, as the protocol progresses. Uh, and then it's all computed on via GPUs on by validators on a knowledge graph and that knowledge is obtained. Uh, it sounds like this is kind of like, well, not really fantastic. Uh, and at first it's not, uh, but while we're doing it, we realize that with the help of changing the semantical field, users can have a lot of things that are introduced to them which weren't available before. Uh, starting with autonomous robots, uh, going on to personal databases, for example, somebody who's been, I don't know, let's say you've been um, trading on chain and uh, you know making transactions, you've been uh, reading white papers, you've been reading some uh, information books about trading, and you've been linking all the stuff, you've been committing to the knowledge graph all this time for three years, and then what you can do, because that information is stored locally in your own browser, it's not actually a browser, but we call it a browser because there's no other word for it right now. Um, you, could, you go to that browser and you ask it a question, well, what have I been doing wrong? And that browser will actually give you an answer. It will tell you, yeah, well, I've been watching what you've been linking. I've been watching your personal knowledge graph. So basically you have the ability to talk to, to God and God being yourself, obviously, and not somebody else. So um, this is just like some simple things. Uh, it can introduce things like uh, unified semantics. Uh, it can let developers actually take matter in their own hands and let and let developers decide how their uh, apps or whatever they do uh, index is indexed. Because right now, if I'm a developer and I did an app, I don't have the power to say to Google how to index it. Right? Google decides to do it, not me, and that's not okay. Once again, so once again, all of this is uh, basically to to be honest with you, we actually took Google's original page rank. As as the, the 
foundation, we introduced civil resistance, uh, we introduced bandwidth, uh, some dynamics, and, and it works. I mean, basically, Google can do it as well, but uh, I, I hope that maybe they will one day. Um, this is, all right, you can't see it, and I didn't think you will be able to see it, so we're not gonna go there, but that's, uh, those are the differences between how we function and how Google functions. Uh, all of this is available on GitHub right here, and that's pretty much it. I'm gonna keep it short, so thank you. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, Diego, I kind of made it short, and he didn't even, I did it in 10 minutes. Because I knew I had As a guy there. Yeah, uh, thank you. The, I think the, uh, we ha talked uh, yesterday also. Yeah. I think this was, uh, I think it's one of the most like valuable like uh, talk that I here uh, got exposed to these ideas that you're uh, uh, working on, and I'm just thinking like how in future like you know this uh, uh, knowledge graph, how, how would you like protect it in future like you know uh, maybe being. Uh, stolen, like you know, uh, information about you. How how would that work? Uh? It's a very good question. Um, I've, we've actually been asked a lot about abusing, and when we were launching a few days ago, our last test night, we did it live, and we had a few about three or four people ask pretty much the same question. They say, "Well, how will I be safe from abused?" Well, there's two answers. For one, this is a distributed thing; it's a decentralized thing. So the more people do that the more it is protected. Uh, the second answer is is all the information that you do, right, is uh, actually stored locally. Well, we, we are, while we are concerned about privacy right now, uh, the knowledge graph is not private, and actually, well, we, we have ideas how to do it, but we are not certain 100% how to achieve it now, because otherwise we're not gonna make it scalable. Um, and well, on the other hand, Right now, that that information is only hashes of the information, so nobody actually knows what what it is. It's not something something that it's not like you say, well, this is me, and have a look at it, take it. Um, to go back to the abusement thing, the funny thing that we realized is that if people try to abuse that mechanism, they don't abuse anyone but themselves. So uh, and it, and, it, and it's, it's fantastic. It, it's a very simple idea of of, of changing the way we look at semantics can actually help us to, to, to change pretty much the whole, the whole web and uh, yeah, so I'm not sure if it answered your question, but um, yeah, sorry, yeah, I'll, I'll try maybe later on like a one 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 to one yeah. Any more questions? Yeah, go on. Yeah, sure. Um, my question is the role of proprietary software and DRM on the end user devices as a way of powering the oppression. Would you like to sort of comment on that? Can, can you define what you mean by proprietary software? Uh, anything where it's not open source, any, I mean, uh, anything that doesn't meet the, the definition of the Free Software Foundation and, all the, and the uh, intersection between the Free Software Foundation and the Open Source Consortium. So the software is proprietary. DRM, uh, Digital Rights Management, Digital Restrictions Management, uh, Digital Locks, Copy Protection. That's a good question. Um, I don't know if I have time to answer that. Okay, thanks. So sorry, I think I kind of moved beyond the line that says stand back. Uh, broke the rule. Uh, sorry. Um, well, everything that we use is open source. Everything that we use, including the original page rank, it's open sourced. Um, so um, there is nothing really that, that, that we want. There is no company behind us. We don't do jurisdictions, we don't believe in CAPTCHAs, we don't believe in KYCs, we don't believe in IMLs, we don't believe in laws, we don't believe that laws can help us to solve uh, whether it's Swiss laws or whether it's the law from my mother's uh, garden or whatever. I don't believe in that bullshit. I'm old enough, I'm 34, I'm old enough to, 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 to have seen that laws don't function. And the only law that functions is a distributed consensus. And while, well, once again, if, some, I'm not saying that it's protected from somewhere, someone coming in 10 years' time and saying uh, that, oh, oh wait, that, sir, that, that, that thing that you used here was proprietary and now I, I will sue you. Well, hopefully that in 10 years' time it will work a whole different, uh, completely differently, 
but I don't think anybody can be protected from that. I know that, for example, in Russia right now, there is a big case with Nginx, where the Rumbler uh, decided 20 years, sorry, 15 years after this was developed, they decided to sue the guy and say, well, this is our software. It's been open source for 15 years. So, well, no, really, it's not. So this is, again, a problem of the law. It's not the problem of the protocol. It's the problem that the laws that try to restrict people and to try to tell them what to think, how to think, and that's exactly what we're trying to work against. So, once again, I'm not sure if I answered, but yeah. Try it. <laughs> yeah, any more questions or do you have any more time? I'm not sure. No? Okay, thank you. Thanks. All right, thank you very much, Serge. Thank you for.